This is the Master Brewers Podcast, brought to you by the Master Brewers Association of the Americas, a volunteer organization dedicated to continually improving the products and processes of our membership since 1887. Let's go! 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 Master Brewers brings you interviews with the industry's best and brightest in brewing science, technology, and operations. This Master Brewers podcast is proudly sponsored by Barnum Mechanical, a full-service design build firm specializing in turnkey process and utility systems for the brewing industry. You know beer. We know breweries. Additional support provided by... Draft Lab knows that quality and consistency are your brewery's top priorities. Draft Lab provides easy-to-use sensory analysis tools designed to bring your tasting data into action. To start your free two-week trial today, visit DraftLab.com. That's D-R-A-U-G-H-T Lab.com. I think that the yeast drying was was definitely important to the fact that these yeasts um, survived. Where um, it seems like a lot of the you know traditional European yeasts did did die out. Uh, the other the other big thing is that they they share the yeast too. So there's a, you know, a culture of sharing there. And if you uh, if you've got your own yeast and your neighbor's goes bad, then it's second nature to just give them the yeast. And so that helps to make sure that good quality yeast sort of stay around and perpetuate and don't just die out. This week on the show, Norwegian land race brewing yeast and the beers they produce. Uh, hi, my name is Richard Priest, and I'm with Escarbon Laboratories, which is a yeast company based in Guelph, Ontario in Canada. What exactly is a Norwegian farmhouse beer? A lot of listeners, myself included, probably haven't had the opportunity to, to travel to Norway uh, to experience these beers. Tell us about your experience. What do they taste like, look like, smell like? Sure. Yeah. I think it's a really interesting topic and that's, that's where you know, I mean, this whole thing comes from is sort of the, I guess, discovery on a broader sense of, of Norwegian farmhouse brewing, even though it was obviously existing, um, <laughs> perpetually over there. Uh, it's not like there's just one style of Norwegian farmhouse sale. There's actually, you know, several sub styles and each uh, individual farmer is, is uh, doing things in different ways as well. So it's not like even among those styles, there's consistency. But um, that's what I found fascinating uh, going over there to uh, their farmhouse uh, beer festival um, was getting to taste these beers from, from different uh, geographic places within Norway that, that have different sort of uh, flavor profiles and production styles. Like in one part uh, near, near Voss, you have these beers that are very, very malty because they're boiled for an extended period of time. Um, and, you know, very, very fruity because they're fermented with, with kvike yeast. Uh, and then, you know, you go a little bit further north, uh, you know, a few hours north, and you have these uh, raw ales being, you know, the common way of producing beer. It's the complete opposite. There's no boiling whatsoever, just uh, laudering their wort through a bag of hops and then, uh, you know, throwing that wort into a fermenter. And they've um, you've got a completely different flavor profile. Uh, really, the only thing that ties together most of the, the farmhouse beers that are made in Norway is the use of juniper. Um, and that's pretty common. And you have juniper infusion that gets used, uh, basically being juniper branches um, that are infused in all of the water that's used for the brewing. So everything that's used for mashing um, and laudering uh, is is infused with juniper. And that has a, um, you know, a pretty uh, uh, big flavor impact on those beers. And it really does... Uh, um, create a little bit of commonality across what are, you know, quite a lot of diverse brewers and uh, beer production techniques. Yeah, describe describe that unique uh, flavor profile that comes from the juniper. And, and do you really, it, does it really come through in all the different sub-styles? I think it does. I think it's, uh, and, and again, this is why it was, it was useful to go over there and, and taste the sort of the beers in their natural habitat. Um, in addition to, um, you know, some of the, attempts that people have made over here to replicate them um, because the flavor is not, you know, quite as intense as you might have it in gin, for example. Gin is like very intense. 
juniper berry flavor. When you're just infusing the branches, it's a little bit more of a subtle flavor impact. And I think you start picking it out once you're tasting a lot of beers with this stuff in it. And then you taste a beer that doesn't have it. And it's like, oh, okay, that's gone. And then you taste a beer again with the juniper infusion. And you realize, okay, that's the flavor that the juniper is adding. And it is a pretty sort of subtle kind of, um, I guess, kind of a woody, woody taste that, that a lot of those, those beers will have. Okay. And just how many sub styles are there roughly? Uh, I'm definitely not the expert on this. Uh, what I've seen is that there's, you know, really to me, there's three distinct styles. So there's, there's one that, that's usually called Stjordasol. Um, that is, a, a it's a, a beer that's produced from, um, uh, malts, usually house-made malts that are, that are quite smoky in flavor. Um, and those beers can be quite, uh, smoky and intense and, and high alcohol. Um, and then there's the the raw ales. Uh, they might be called raw ale or corn ale, and you know there's a few different names they use. And those are the beers that are not boiled, um, and they have a really distinct flavor profile um, simply because they're not boiled. And you have the flavor of sort of raw malt that's uh, a really driving uh, character there. And then there's also the the Voss ale as well, which is the one with the, the really extended boil that's um, very sort of malty and caramelly. Um, but I'm sure there, there's other you know. Uh, Substyles out there as well, and I'm not the absolute most versed in uh, Norwegian farmhouse brewing. And you know, some of the guys over there would probably correct me on some of this. Cool. Did you see a, a wide variety of you know carbonation and clarity and color and all that too? I mean, was that was everything all over the place, or any other sort of attributes that were consistent across the the spectrum there? Okay. Uh, so yeah, that, that something that is common across most Norwegian farmhouse ales is low carbonation. Most of these are served at you know, what I would call maybe a cask level of carbonation, um, so quite low. You know, typically whatever is just residual in the primary fermentation is is more or less what it's served with. Um, as the farmhouse brewers start to uh, integrate a little bit more into the general or with the general uh, home brewing community, you do see some of them um, adopting things like kegs uh, for carbonation. So you do see some. Uh, some some with more or less carbonation than the others, and same thing. Um, you know, some of them might, you know, adopt some of the home brewing techniques to achieve clarity, and so you might see more or less clarity. But in, in general, most of the beers are are uh, pretty pretty cloudy and pretty uh, low carbonation, so they really you know can feel sort of like very uh, um, rustic cask beers. These beers are fermented at very high temperatures, but are reported to be without the off flavors that most brewers would expect from doing that. How does uh, Kvike yeast produce clean beer at such high temperatures? Yeah, that's one thing that's really special about them. And one thing that was, you know, really surprising to me uh, learning about this stuff, um, that by and large, these uh, farmhouse brewers are, are pitching their, their yeast at very high temperatures. Uh, anyway, anywhere from 28 to 40 Celsius, uh, 40 Celsius being absolutely crazy for a beer fermentation. I mean, the yeast will die a little bit above that. Um, so yeah, that was sort of our first question is like, does this taste good? Um, and by and large, uh, most of these yeasts are able to produce uh, clean, clean flavors at these elevated temperatures. Um, in general, we we have some, you know, some hints that they're adapted to thermotolerance and that might explain why they're not producing as many off flavors at elevated temperatures as normal yeast might um you know it does seem like they're not making a lot of those sort of um high ester flavors or like bad ester flavors or uh, or fusel alcohols at elevated temperatures where a lot of the other um beer yeasts might You've sampled Kvike yeast from different locations in Norway, which sounds like a great excuse for a trip. Tell us more about <laughs> that sampling. Sure. So unfortunately, I, I, I didn't actually get to go over to Norway for that sampling. Um, all of the samples What's were, wrong with you? <laughs> I know. I know. That happened later. Um, all of the samples were collected originally um, by a guy named Lars Marius Garshall. Um, he's the guy who I think really just sort of sp spread this... Uh, information about Norwegian farmhouse brewing to the rest of the world. Uh, he's got a great blog called Lars Blog. Um, and I, I had sort of found out about these, these yeasts through his writing and being you know, kind of blown away by the potential properties of these things. So I, uh, you know, sent him a number of uh, emails and messages. And eventually he, he relented and sent me um, some of these samples. 
um, of of either uh, dried or or liquid uh, kvike yeasts. So he had collected them, and he still does collect them and and send them on to us and a few other researchers around the world. Very interesting. So uh, you said some were dry and some were not. Uh, what, yeah. what percentage of them were dried? And and also, is it safe to assume that those samples were dried by the Nor- Norwegians who were using it, or or what happened there? Yeah. So for this, um, uh, the original project we did, uh, only two of them were dried. Um, the rest were uh, liquid samples. Uh, we've sort of since reversed that because most of the, the, the farmhouse brewers are actually drying their yeasts to uh, keep them between batches of beer, um, whereas a lot of the original yeast we got came from uh, Lars' uh, home brewing where he was keeping them as liquid slurries. So, you know, the original uh, project we did, it was mostly liquid, but that's sort of since reversed because we're getting a lot of these, you know, sort of right from the, uh, from the farmer brewers. And uh, they're typically drying the yeast, which is, uh, which is, you know, pretty interesting that they have this sort of culture. Yeah, what can, um, you, what can you tell us about their yeast drying techniques? Yeah, it's, it's you know, in my mind, uh, and even speaking as a, as a, you know, a yeast scientist, uh, it's, it's pretty advanced. Um, they've been doing this for a really long time. There's examples of technology like yeast logs and yeast rings um, dating back uh, four or five hundred years. Um, so, you know, something with a lot of surface area that you can dip into your fermentation and it sort of yeast dries out on the outside and you can, you know, dip that ring or that log into the next batch to start fermenting it. Um, since then, no one really uses that anymore. They, uh, they've moved on to uh, sheet pans. So they'll, they'll take a little bit of their, uh, you know, the top crop their yeast or bottom crop their yeast, take a little bit of it and spread it out on a sheet pan and just put it in an oven with, you know, maybe with the pilot light on or something and let that sort of dry out um, as a sheet and then crumble it up and throw it in the freezer. And that's the, you know, the typical way that they're drying their yeast now. And um, it it actually works, at least for these yeast strains, it works really well. Um, They tend to have, you know, very, very good uh, viability and vitality out of the dried yeast. Talk about the the role that yeast drying has played in preserving that lineage of kvik yeast, and what does that tell us about yeast domestication? Sure, um, that's a big question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, you can have a big answer. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that the yeast drying was was definitely important to the fact that these yeasts um, survived. Where um, it seems like a lot of the you know traditional European yeasts did did die out. Um, I and mean, if you look at, you know, there was farmhouse brewing everywhere, you know, not just in Scandinavia and Belgium, there was farmhouse brewing all over Europe. And I think a lot of those yeasts probably died off because maybe, uh, you know, people didn't have the ability to preserve them quite as well as, as the Norwegians did. And so I think that's helped a lot. It also is sort of reflective of the Norwegian um, brewing and drinking culture in the sense that these guys are mostly only brewing for you know, Christmas and weddings, it's not, you know, frequent brewing. So they needed a way to keep the yeast um, for extended periods of time because they're only brewing maybe three or four times a year. Um, so I think it came out of necessity, but it also meant that they were able to keep these yeasts alive um, and pure for a really long period of time. Um, the other, you know, thing that the drying does is it's a big hurdle for a lot of the other uh, potential contaminants that might be there, like wild yeasts and bacteria. And uh, drying out the yeast probably helps preserve it as a relatively pure culture as well. Um, and I think that that's a, part, a big reason why they've also been able to keep this alive for so long. Uh, the, other, the other big thing is that they, they share the yeast too. So there's a, you know, a culture of sharing there. And if, you, uh, if you've got your own yeast and your neighbor's goes bad, then it's second nature to just give them the yeast. And so that helps to make sure that good quality yeast sort of stay around and perpetuate and don't just die out um, like they may have in, you know, other places in Europe. Um, you know, by and large, these are domesticated yeasts and they're, they're fairly similar to um, the other domesticated yeasts um, that, we, that we, you know, already have in our um, professional brewing traditions, but with a few uh, quirks. Coming up. These are, you know, thermotolerant yeast, high temperature tolerant, um, that they do have these uh, clean flavors at high temperatures um, and that they are genetically uh, interesting and genetically unique. I'm John Bryce, and you're listening to the Master Brewers podcast from the Master Brewers Association of the Americas. <laughs> 
This episode is brought to you by... ABS Commercial is a full-service brewery and parts outfitter. From our Raleigh headquarters to our Denver office, we proudly offer brew houses and fermenters from three barrels and up, yeast brinks, boilers, kegs, chillers, tri-clamp, and other stainless parts, all with the quickest delivery and lead times in the industry. Learn more at abs-commercial.com or call 877-BREW-ABS. ABS Commercial. We are brewers. Here's what's coming up on the Master Brewers calendar. District Northern California invites you to attend the California Craft Beer Summit September 6th through the 8th in Sacramento. The District Rocky Mountain Summer Meeting is September 7th and 8th in Cheyenne, Wyoming. It may still be summer in Cheyenne. Meanwhile, District Midwest holds its fall meeting September 8th at Fatheads in Middleburg Heights. The Master Brewers Engineering and Utilities course begins September 9th in Madison. Don't miss the keg cleaning and sanitizing webinar September 12th. District Western New York meets at FX Mat in Utica September 13th. The District St. Paul Minneapolis Golf Outing and September Meeting is September 14th. The St. Louis Annual Golf Tournament is September 20th. The 2018 District Ontario Iron Brewer is September 28th. And District Southern California meets in San Diego September 29th. View the full calendar of events at mbaa.com for more details or to find a district meeting near you. Now back to the show. Why don't you talk about what happened when you got that dry yeast back to your lab? Something surprising happened there. Yeah, that was, uh, that was, uh, we got a couple of these sort of little, they just look like, you know, brown flakes of mud, basically. Um, this dried yeast, uh, like I said, they dry it out on a, on a sheet. So it's just sort of these little crumbles. Um, so I, and I got the stuff in, I'm like, okay, home dried yeast. How, how good is this going to be? Um, so I, I rehydrated it in a, a little bit of wort and, uh, left for lunch and came back, uh, 40 minutes later and this stuff's fermenting. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the guy had told me that this was about a year old, you know, year old dried yeast and it's huh, it's rehydrated and fermenting in 40 minutes. And I, you know, I look at it under the microscope and uh, almost all of the cells are alive. Um, that, that, was, that was quite surprising um, to discover that, yeah, some of these farmers can, can make dry yeast uh, just as well as the big guys can. You've spent a lot of time studying the genetics of these kvike yeasts. Tell us about what you've observed. Yeah, so we've we've done a few different uh, methods to look at the genetics of bikes. So our, our first approach was to use a technique called uh, PCR fingerprinting, um, which basically, for <laughs> trying to explain it simply, is uh, you're amplifying uh, certain chunks of DNA from the genome, and yeasts that are more closely related to each other will have a more similar banding pattern of DNA. Um, resulting from this PCR than those that are less closely related. Um, so we ended up doing this with uh, uh, 25 uh, kvikis from um, our original project, and we also tried to compare it to uh, a number of beer yeasts, uh, wine yeasts, bread yeast, just trying to cover all of our bases. And uh, what we had found there was that all of the kvikes seemed to be related to each other and that they uh, were more closely related to each other than they were to the other, um, the other domesticated yeasts. Um, the other thing that that showed us is that they were likely closest related to um, the, the standard sort of beer yeasts, um, which was also pretty interesting to us. Um, so what we ended up doing, um, just because that PCR fingerprinting isn't the most detailed approach, it's like, a, you know, if we're going to use a, you know, a analogy it'd be like a little thumbnail compared to like a you know high res uh high res uh image uh we wanted to do the whole genome sequencing of at least a few of the yeast so we were able to do that as well um so we did whole genome sequencing of six of the yeasts um selected from this project uh to do a better job of comparing them genetically to the existing beer yeasts and what we did find there is that they are uh, also um, still cr- uh, closely related to those uh, domesticated beer yeasts, uh, what's called the beer one group. Um, but they are still, uh, you know, not really super closely 
related to any of the sort of subfamilies within that group, and they kind of form their own um, subgroup of uh, beer yeasts among that, uh, that genetic group of domesticated yeasts. You've got a paper uh, that's soon to be published. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so that's sort of summarizing uh, most of the work that we've done on these yeasts um, thus far. So uh, we really wanted to, um, you know, look at look at a lot of the anecdotes that are out there about these yeasts that they can um, tolerate, you know, really high temperatures, that they can make uh, interesting flavors and clean flavors at those elevated temperatures, um, and that there's, you know, something interesting genetically about them and, and try to sort of, um, you know, bundle that all into one research paper. Um, so we we collaborated with um, our our colleagues at the University of Guelph, um, as well as a guy named Christopher Progress at BTT, um, who helped us with some of the genome sequencing work, um, and that sort of resulted in in what I think is a a pretty good story about um, the Kvikis that really helps to um, understand these things a little bit better, um, and. Um, really does uh, help to confirm that these are, you know, thermotolerant yeast, high temperature tolerant, um, that they do have these uh, clean flavors at high temperatures, um, and that they are genetically uh, interesting and genetically unique, um, that they're somewhat related to the uh, existing domesticated yeast, but that there's, uh, you know, some uh, uh, interesting quirks there, and that, um, for example, we think they might be, a, you know, a hybrid of a of a you know domesticated beer yeast and and something else, um, maybe some wild Norwegian yeast or something like that, um, and that's uh, that's pretty interesting because uh, you don't see a whole lot of that kind of uh, genetic makeup uh, among beer yeasts. You, you did some miniature uh, fermentation trials. T- talk talk about those and kind of tell us what <laughs> you learned from those. Yeah, so that that tends to be how um, how uh, how we sort of start these projects. Um, screening beer yeasts, it almost always starts in a, in a mini ferment. Um, we use these little glass jars with airlocks, so it's almost like a very, very tiny um, fermenter, and that allows us to screen a lot of yeast at, at the same time and, um, you know, have enough samples that we have uh, statistically relevant uh, numbers of samples, and so we were able to do a whole bunch of little tiny um, quike ferments um, at the same time under the same conditions. Um, and when we did this uh, screen, sort of comparing the, the 25 quike strains to uh, some controlled domesticated uh, beer strains, uh, the results were interesting. We did see that they, uh, they make some of the fruity aromas, like um, um, the fatty acid esters, the sort of apple and uh, pineapple aromas. Um, they were all almost all uh, non-phenolic. Um, and that they, uh, they produced lower amounts of um, at least one uh, fusel alcohol compared to, um, for example, some of the other domesticated uh, beer yeasts. So that, that sort of helps to confirm what people suspected about these yeasts is that they, they can, you know, make nice fruity flavors, but they don't make these off flavors. And these fermentations were done at 30 Celsius, which is, which is quite warm. We probably wouldn't ferment a normal, uh, normal beer yeast at that temperature. No way. Okay. Uh, do you want to talk more about, uh, talk a little bit about what you found in regards to um, maybe expand on the flavor analysis a little bit, but also talk about the fermentation rates and that sort of thing? Yeah. So because these things have uh, generally positive flavors at high temperatures, uh, it really does sort of hammer home that these things can be useful for um, really innovative ferments. It means that uh, home brewers, for example, who may not have temperature control in their in their uh, in their home breweries, um, are able to um, produce clean beers even in the summer without having to worry about temperature control. It also means that um, breweries, maybe even breweries in tropical climates or hot climates, um, could use these yeasts and don't have to worry quite so much about cooling. And that there might be a um, you know an environmental argument to using these yeasts that I, I find somewhat compelling. Um, Sorry, what was the second question? <laughs> Has, well, I'll ask a different one. Has anyone tried, ha- have you or anyone else tried fermenting uh, kvike yeast at lower temperatures? Does anything different happen if you do that? Uh, so they still, many of them still will tolerate lower temperatures. Uh, we do find that if they're fermented at a temperature range that's more typical of ales, uh, that they do have a much more neutral flavor profile. They behave a lot more like uh, normal ale yeasts would. 
Okay. We, we did, uh, we were able to quantify a lot of the, the flavor compounds um, produced by these yeasts, but I still think that there's some things that are, that are a little mysterious, uh, perhaps flavors that are made by these yeasts that are not made by others, that aren't part of the regular uh, sort of uh, screen of, of flavor compounds that we're typically looking for. Uh, there are flavors that come out in these yeasts, uh, and, and this is this is based on our sensory analysis and based on uh, other people's anecdotes that that do seem quite unique for these yeasts. For, so, for example, you have some that are producing uh, very heavy citrus or orange-like flavor, and you have others that produce um, what's described as a caramel or mushroom-like flavor um, that is quite unique to these yeasts. And we still don't quite know exactly which uh, flavor compounds those are. Um, so we think that they're producing unique flavors. Uh, but we don't necessarily have uh, the evidence for that yet. Most of these samples you received were actually mixed cultures, meaning there was not just one flake yeast, but quite a few different ones. Talk a little bit about that. How, how many different strains did you typically see in a given sample? Yeah, that was also something that was uh, surprising to us because these are these uh, cultures that have been maintained by these uh, farmers for uh, generations. Uh, when we got these samples and plated them out, uh, we use a, a differential agar um, for Saccharomyces um, called WLN. And uh, that, that agar sort of uh, makes different strains of yeast uh, take up this dye in it in different ways. And so it's really a really quick way to distinguish um, uh, between strains of yeast. It's obviously not perfect because, you know, if you've got 15 different strains in a mix, you're definitely going to mix some. Uh, missed some. And so uh, when we took these, uh, these spike samples and plated them onto, these, onto this agar, we, we saw immediately that there's a surprising amount of uh, yeast diversity in there. Um, and that, you know, at least for this first project, uh, some of the cultures had uh, up to nine different uh, strains of yeast in them. And, you know, we're fairly convinced that, you know, even that is an un underestimation and that uh, the yeast isolation of the project um, could be expanded later on and that there, you know, there might be even more diversity among these, um, these source yeasts. Um, I know that other labs are also working on this kind of thing and trying to understand just how much um, just Saccharomyces cerevisiae diversity there is in, uh, in original clay yeasts. Okay, I, I want to talk about the flocculation a little bit because your analysis of flocculation showed a very wide range, and I'm wondering how that's possible that you'd see such a wide wide range uh, within a given mixed culture like that. Yeah, that's kind of surprising too. Uh, when we when we look at the individual yeast strains from these uh, quite cultures, we did, and we looked at specifically at the flocculation of these. We saw that there was a pretty wide range, even among. Um, specific cultures. Like, for example, one of them had uh, two strains that were highly flocculent and then another strain that was barely flocculent at all. And that's, that's quite interesting because you would think logically that if, if the brewers are, are, you know, cropping repetitively, that you might select for one, uh, one flocculation behavior, right? right. Um, yeah. But that seems to not be the case. So what we do know is that often the brewers are top cropping and, and that tends to not select as, um, as heavily for uh, flocculent yeasts. Obviously, they do need to still be able to aggregate um, to, to, you know, sort of float on top of the, the beer and be, uh, be able to be cropped. Um, but that, that's one possibility. The other possibility is that we do know that some uh, sometimes mixed Saccharomyces cultures can co-flocculate. So if you have a flocculent strain mixed with a non-flocculent strain, that flocculent strain can help to pull that non-flocculent strain out of solution. And that, that's a, another um, plausible reason uh, why this might be happening with the clay yeast and why they're able to sort of maintain this population of uh, flocculent and non-flocculent yeasts. With so much complexity here, where do you recommend a brewer get started if they want to, you know, attempt to make clay for the first time? What, what yeast should they select? Yeah, I, I agree that it's, it's gotten enormously complicated. I mean, there's, there's so many of these uh, base uh, stock cultures floating around out there. Uh, if you know where to look, it can get very daunting. Um, I will say there are a number of yeast labs that have um, different Kvike yeasts on the market, and they've mostly focused on um, the yeasts from Voss and Hornendal. Um, we, we have these as well as uh, Omega Labs in Chicago, as well as the Yeast Bay, I believe, in uh, in California. 
Um, so there are definitely places brewers uh, can go to for these cultures. And I think these are two really good examples for um, sort, of, sort of diving into Kvike because uh, the Voss yeasts tend to be the ones that have that very clear citrusy flavor. Uh, those are the ones that you can pitch up to 40 Celsius. And uh, basically, the hotter you go, the more of that flavor you can get. Uh, and then the Hornendal yeasts are, are very, very different. Those are ones that have a uh, really uh, large amount of those uh, fatty acid esters that, that contribute a uh, almost tropical flavor profile to the, to the beers. Um, and those are also the ones that have some of those sort of mysterious uh, mushroomy and caramelly flavors. Um, and, and that's just a totally different beast. You can make uh, New England IPA with the Hornendal strains, for example, and ferment it at 30 Celsius, and you can get a really nice, um, you know, complex fruit character out of those uh, beers. So what's next for these yeasts? So we're very curious to see what happens next with uh, Kvike yeast. Uh, we're still interested in continuing to uh, research them on a fundamental academic side because we do think that they are giving us more information, uh, more insight into yeast domestication. And ultimately, that's going to you know, help us uh, um, in terms of uh, understanding all of the domesticated yeast that we're working with and help to uh, develop and, and you know, basically work with our yeast a little bit better in the future. Beyond that, I do see these yeasts getting more popular in the industry. Uh, I was just just down in the U.S. Um, in in Minnesota at their Brewers Guild conference, and it was uh, you know mind blowing to me to to talk to so many brewers who had uh, worked with with bike yeasts already down there. And I think that that's a sign for the future that we're going to see a lot more of these things pop up as people um, discover that these are you know clean yeasts that can be used for a wide range of beers. Uh, that can uh, that can ferment hot in situations where normal yeast would fail, and that do have unique flavor profiles that work with a lot of the the beers that are popular now. Uh, I think that that's really exciting. And the other thing is that I, I'm also still seeing interest from brewers that want to make the traditional beers, and uh, seeing that interest um, internationally in the traditional beers that are being made in Norway is is really exciting to those guys too. And that um, I really do think that the international interest in these yeasts and these beers is helping to keep the tradition alive over there, too. That was Richard Priest here on the Master Brewers podcast. In the episode notes, you'll find a link to his presentation at the 2018 ETC, as well as his latest publication, which is hot off the press at Frontiers. Did you enjoy today's episode? Would you like us to keep making more? If so, there's a really simple way you can let us know. Subscribe, rate, and review the Master Brewers podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Just like that one day, like everyone else did. Countdown, I'm moving too fast. And then-